Howdy, my name is Ben Hayworth. I'm a graduate student at Penn State. And thank you to the conveners for giving me the opportunity to talk about this project that I quite literally just started. So if you like some of the predictions uh, about this that I'm making, you should come to AGU to see the final results. All right, so in general, the project I'm looking at is whether or not space weather can impact an exoplanet's atmospheric chemistry on such a level that you then can affect its habitability and perhaps future observations of that planet. Uh, so I am currently in everyone's favorite part of a project, model development. So I'm kind of stuck right now up in those first two boxes. But that's not what's driving the project. What's driving it are... What? That's on the inside of your shirt. Appreciate it. That's, oh, that's much better. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm right now stuck in those first two boxes, but what's driving it are the potential implications of this. So the first one, which has been explored by another group, is that space weather can potentially build up abiotically nitrous oxide on your planet, which is a potent greenhouse gas, so it can radiatively force it. And then I put plus haze there because nitrous oxide, we find in our preliminary results, has a very interesting relationship with organic haze that you build up on your planet. And both of those impact the habitability of a planet. So we want to explore that relationship further over a wide sweep of parameter space. Now, I also put observations because one, uh, like Sukrit said, N2O is a potential biosignature. On modern day Earth, the only two processes that really build up N2O is lightning and life. And if we are able to abiotically build it up uh, with another process, we should look at whether or not that is a good biosignature. And also, what environments can it build up? It turns out space weather may not be able to build up N2O in certain environments, but it can in others. And that's something we want to explore. And uh, finally, this one's more speculative, but this is what actually got me thinking about this problem, was right now we talk a lot about whether a magnetic field is necessary or impacts the habitability of an exoplanet. But at least for terrestrial ones, we have no way of detecting them. Uh, it's well below any detection threshold we can think of. But if we know a process uh, that impacts the atmospheric chemistry of a planet and can potentially be buffered by that planet's magnetic field, we could use that as a proxy for inferring whether or not these planets may have a magnetic field. All right, so I keep saying space weather. What am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, solar proton events, those that follow coronal mass ejections. So this is one for our own sun in 2012. What these are, they're very magnetically... Uh, active events where the star will shed some of its coronal mass in the form of a plasma stream. These streams are going to be very high number density, high uh, energy charged particles, and they preferentially occur in the axis of rotation of your star. So for systems that are not, not misaligned, uh, this will also hit your planets. Uh, it depends on how active the star is. Our star right now is pretty quiet, but we know a lot of M dwarves that are very active. Now, it's also been proposed that potentially magnetic fields uh, can shield you from this. That's actually one of their arguments for why they might be good for habitability. Uh, this right here, uh, from the other group I'll mention in a second, this was a Carrington-like event modeled against modern-day Earth's magnetic field. Uh, the white lines are our magnetic field lines, and you'll see that it's actually able to shear uh, the Earth's magnetic field open enough that more of these particles can make it in. Uh, so I'm not going to be talking about solar wind. The reason for that is that's constantly buffeting the Earth's uh, magnetic or atmosphere, and it's not really driving any chemistry, mainly because those particles are typically slow enough energy that they're deflected by our magnetic field, and even those that are able to make it in lose their energy well above 100 kilometers um, in most cases. All right, so what kind of chemistry are these high-energy particles able to drive? It's relatively simple. It's just splitting N2, which is a very difficult thing to do in the modern atmosphere. So like I said, lightning down in the troposphere is able to split N2. It's a really difficult triple bond. Um, and we don't readily photolyze N2 in the lower atmosphere. The reason for that is the wavelengths that are able to make it into our uh, mid-altitudes, uh, the absorption cross-section for ionization and dissociation for N2 are relatively similar. So we end up ionizing some N2, but not really dissociating it. So what occurs is these high energy protons are able to make it into the atmosphere. They will ionize the neutral gas around them. And then the subsequent secondary electrons then have the correct cross sections and energies to split N2. And once you split N2, it can stick to other things like hydrogen. It's very reactive. And you end up getting N2O or HCN, uh, usually not both of them. And that depends on your, uh, atmosphere, your background atmosphere. 
So this process had previously been explored by uh, Eric Peachin et al. in 2016. Uh, it's a very exciting idea that space weather can drive atmospheric chemistry. Uh, so they used a very sophisticated uh, magnetohydrodynamic model to calculate these particle fluxes at the top of the planet's atmosphere, how many are able to make it through the magnetic field, and then down into it. And then they used a sort of a box chemical model to see what happened. So these are some profiles from their chemical model. And they found that in the mid altitudes, like say 30 to 40 kilometers, they could get parts per million of nitrous oxide, which is enough for it to be radiatively effective. Now, what we want to do is go back and look at this process, but there was some physics missing in the original chemical model. So we want to explore that because a lot of this is very important for N2. The first one is photolysis. So originally it was used in optimistic and a pessimistic photo destruction rate. Uh, it turns out when you look at N2O wavelength by wavelength in, uh, it very, very readily wants to photo dissociate at almost any UV wavelength. Um, so that's something you have to consider. Also convection. So a lot of these high energy particles, again, they will fall off with pressure as they enter the atmosphere. So you'll be doing a lot of this chemistry high up and then less and less as you work your way down. So mixing processes are important to consider when you're doing this chemistry. Uh, third is organic haze. So I just said N2O likes to photolyze very easily and you need something to shield it. So we are thinking what could shield it out to those wavelengths and organic haze, if it's thick enough, is very capable of shielding in the UV. I put fractal up here just because people that uh, typically model haze know that it's not nice little spheres that you model when it's scattering. It typically aggregates into gross geometries, which will pretend are fractals. And that makes it a very effective scatterer in the UV. So it allows it to shield out to, uh, further wavelengths. And then finally, uh, ion chemistry. So I just said these protons, as they come through the atmosphere, they'll be producing secondary electrons. That ionizes the background neutral atmosphere. And while it's short-lived, it's on the similar timescales as these chemical reactions. And the reactive cross-sections for those ions are considerably different than their neutral counterparts. So these are you know, the physics that we're going to be throwing in the model that I'm currently working on. OK, so I'll run through this real quick because this is the boring part. Uh, but I can't get a thesis doing this on the back of a cocktail napkin. I have to show that I did some science. So uh, we'll be looking at how efficiently these particles are able to propagate through the atmosphere. Once we know their fluxes by altitude, we can then run them through our chemical model to know how much of this uh, chemistry is actually going to be driven. Do we end up with N2O, HCN, haze? Um, and then we also do care about the habitability, so we can then take those profiles, mixing ratio profiles, and run them through a 1D radiative convective model to see if they have any effect on the surface temperature. And finally, I did mention that in the future, we want to think of what these signals would mean observationally, so we can use uh, SMART or PSG, which we've currently been looking at, uh, to generate spectra using those uh, pressure, temperature, and mixing ratio profiles. Okay. So I said N2O readily photolyzes. Uh, the left plot right here, that red line, is the absorption cross-section for nitrous oxide. And these black lines right here are the fraction of its photolysis per wavelength bin. And just right up front, I'll tell you, both of those curves integrate to about one. So almost all the N2O you build up immediately photolyzes in UV. Uh, the black solid line is at the top of the atmosphere, so it's photolyzing over its entire range. That's because there's nothing shielding it. And then down in the troposphere, I believe this was 15 kilometers, uh, none of it's photolyzing out to 2,000 angstroms. Uh, that's because CO2 is an effective shield. And then immediately after it, everything photolyzes. So we tried to think, what can we put that can shield it out to at least 2,500 angstroms? So we tried methane, uh, like the previous authors had proposed. Uh, methane, though, while it dissociates under UV, it is not effective past like 1,700 angstroms. So this plot right here is we were just taking upper fluxes from the previous Air Peach and et al.'s group, plugging them in and seeing, can we get any of this to convect down and then be shielded by methane? Uh, this was an unrealistically methane heavy case. That was like a 20% mixing ratio of methane on the planet. All right, but can Hayes shield it? The answer is yes. So uh, after Sarah's talk, I feel like I should talk about different kinds of hazes than the one in this model, but it is just a hydrocarbon haze because that's what we currently have optical properties for. Uh, but I'd be excited to get nitrogen bearing hazes. Um, okay, so in our model, what we do is we build up uh, a hydrocarbon haze by adjusting the methane to CO2 ratio under a UV environment. And this is for a relatively thick haze. 
You'll see at the top of the atmosphere and at 75 kilometers, almost none of our UV energy is lost. Once you get to 50 kilometers, you start to just dip below that haze deck. And then down at 25 in the surface, almost none of the UV makes it down there. So uh, organic haze can be an effective shield for this. Now, what does this mean for habitability? We know that we need haze to shield N2O, and we know that N2O can radiatively force uh, the climate. So the previous work was done for the early Earth. The Arapichon et al. group wanted to answer the faint young sun paradox. If we had a more active young star, could we potentially warm it with this N2O? Uh, and that seems like a natural place to start, since we have a different suite of models, and it's always good to retest hypotheses. I throw up an orange Earth, because I'm going to pretend early Earth was hazy. If you disagree, I don't know. <laughs> I need it for this. <laughs> All right, and then also early Mars, we have problem warming that, so it's a natural next step. But this is exoclimb, so we care about exoplanets. And this is where it's going to be really interesting to explore the relationship between haze and N2O. So I put the Trappist system up here on purpose because it's orbiting an M dwarf, uh, very active stars. They all have very frequent coronal mass ejections. And also, they are all orbiting very close to the star. So not only will you uh, experience more of these high-energy particles, but more of them will uh, interact with the atmosphere. And they potentially don't have magnetic fields, at least that's what most people think right now, so you shouldn't have any mitigation from that. All right, so let's say we have a very active star, and we want to see how this plays out. You have a very active star, you're going to have more coronal mass ejections, more of these particles in the atmosphere. True. You're also going to have a higher XUV flux from flares. Now, this step is very compositionally dependent, and this is where a large sweep over parameter space is necessary for exoplanets. On the right here, I said having a higher XUV flux means you'll have more organic haze. That is heavily dependent on you having those precursor molecules in your atmosphere. Uh, at least in our model, that would be a methane to CO2 ratio. So if you have a lot of methane, you have enough of that to break apart into CH, very reactive, you'll start to form those haze aggregates. Now on the left, more N2O is produced. That is also generally true if this uh, original hypothesis is correct. However, it's going to depend on the C to O ratio of your atmosphere. So there is a critical point where if you have too much carbon to oxygen, you're going to be forming uh, HCM rather than nitrous oxide. So there is a minimum threshold amount of methane we need to start building a haze, but there might also be a maximum threshold where you'll be uh, creating a gas that's not radiatively important. Still an interesting gas, especially if you like prebiotic chemistry, but not for habitability. And we know haze will have a positive relationship with N2O. You need something to shield it. Uh, now, in general, both of those will have opposing impacts on the planet. If we're forming these really thick hazes that are necessary to form nitrous oxide, uh, they're also going to effectively raise the planetary albedo, which cools the surface, while N2O is a greenhouse gas that will act to warm it. And I have no idea what the magnitudes of those two are competing against one another, and that's something that we definitely want to explore in this. All right, now I talked about observations. N2O is a potential biosignature. Um, I'm not a biologist, but I know it's through nitrate reduction. And N2O does have a nice uh, absorption feature, 4.5 microns, which is potentially observable. Potentially. Um, now, this, on the surface, makes it seem like, oh, N2O might be a bad biosignature. But like we just said, that might depend on the atmosphere. So if we have a very, if you see an atmosphere that's very hazy, and you, like very hazy, and you see nitrous oxide, and I say that tongue in cheek, saying you can see a signature and it's very hazy, uh, you know that maybe space weather would be producing HCN abiotically, not nitrous oxide. So maybe it's still a good biosignature on that kind of atmosphere. So it really depends on it. That's, and we want to explore the difference between a background oxidized atmosphere versus reduced, because that'll also give you uh, different hazes. All right. And finally, this was the more speculative one, uh, whether or not you could use this uh, as a proxy for a magnetic field. And to do that, we would really have to know how many of these ener solar energetic particles are buffered by the planet having a magnetic field versus not. So if you see a planet that you think could have a geodynamo uh, around a very active star and it has a haze but no HCN, maybe that means none of those particles are making it down into the lower atmosphere and can drive that chemistry. Uh, it's very speculative, but that's at least why I found it exciting to begin with. So, and those are my conclusions. And with that, I'll take questions. I left my face gone. <laughs> but can we get up the comments? Oh, sorry. 
What are the what's the photochemical lifetime of nitrous with and without a haze? Uh, without haze, it is. I know it's about three to four orders of magnitude different, but I don't remember the actual numbers. It's about a hundred years. Without okay. Haze. Thank you. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Over on the side. How? Just sort of thinking about most of the plants you're looking at in an exoplanet sense, all tidally locked. So you've got one side where the NTO is going to be photolyzed, but if we can make it over to the night side, will its lifetime be sort of increased significantly? I'm, what are the implications of a tidy lock system? Um, I'm not sure. I, I actually have no idea how hazes would work in 3D if you would be uh, able to transport the necessary photolyzed components to the night side and then continually shield it. So. I don't know, that, that would be a 3D problem and everything I've thought about has been in 1D. But that's an interesting question. Thank you. RJ? RJ from Oxford. Um, does, uh, after you, if you make a lot of N2, if you have a high N2 flux, or N2O flux, does it eventually get converted back to N2 or is, does the N2O end up like, in the ground or something like could could you imagine this being like a sink on in on into and like decreasing the surface pressure of your planet over time or would it just equilibrate at some value yeah no the the particle flux for these energetic particles are not enough to at least for like the modern earth you're not changing the background pressure of n2 by doing this it's it's relatively small scales parts per billion parts per million so. Shami, uh, Oxford, uh, very interesting talk. Um, just a quick question. Is there also a, a minimum threshold for uh, producing N2O uh, uh, with the nitrogen? Like uh, you have to have a nitrogen dominated atmosphere? Or? Right now, that's all I've explored modeling. But yes, there would definitely be a dependence on that. So that would be one thing we'd want to first explore is what's the dependence on your nitrogen partial pressure and formation of N2O, given everything else is the same. But that, yes, there, there would be a dependence. If there are no additional questions, thank you, Nate.